and on um, an agreement uh, that followed the start of record because you're supposed to have to say yes. Really? I, I hit. Oh, it's recording. It's recording. Okay. Yeah, I see it. It's fine. Should, no should, we all hide, should we all hide ourselves for a minute and then reappear? Or we can just chat. We can sit quietly and meditate on the state of our bookstores. Thriving, never better. Never a better place to work. Refuge of sanity and stillness. It looks like it says live on Zoom. <laughs> Which we do. <laughs> <laughs> Live on Zoom. <laughs> the zombie command. <laughs> yeah, I really wanted Zoombie to take off as a, <laughs> a term, but it never did. <laughs> like after the five hours of Zoom classes. <laughs> it's a perfect term. <laughs> Should we get started? Sure. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, here we all are once again. Yeah. Welcome back to Zoom. This is so exciting. Uh oh. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome back to Zoom School, brought to you today by Art Bookstores and Litmus Press on the occasion of the first ever printed matter virtual art book fair, uh, which has been so totally inspiring and exciting to participate in and explore this week. I'm uh, really glad that everyone could be here today and I'm looking forward to sharing this program with everyone in the audience. My name is Ethan. I'm a bookseller at Art Book at MoMA PS1 in New York City. Um, I'm zooming in today from unceded Munsi Lenape and Canarsie land known otherwise as Brighton Beach in Brooklyn. Um, this afternoon on behalf of Art Book Stories, it is my supreme pleasure and privilege to introduce you all to Johanna Drucker and Susan B, who join us from both American coasts to celebrate the publication of their third book together, Off-World Fairy Tales, which we're all very excited to show off today and talk about. Um, joining them in the Zoom room down here on the bottom right is our mutual friend, Rachel Wilson, who can actually introduce the book and its authors. Rachel is the managing editor of Brooklyn indie publisher Litmus Press, who put out Off-World Fairy Tales late last year and who also published Johanna and Susan's second book, Fabulous Femini, in 2015. Their first book together, A Girl's Life, came out from Granary Books in 2002, but dear audience member, worry not, you can find all three collaborations on the art book stores at Printed Matter Virtual Shop, which I'll put a link to in the chat while the artists are talking. Um, on Art Books Printed Matter web shop, not only are we selling all three books in the Fab Femme trilogy, and not only do all three books come with custom artist book plates designed by Susan and signed by both Susan and Johanna, but we also have hundreds of books listed at specialty fair prices from artist monographs to critical theory, to kids books, to limited editions, to literature. Um, if you buy it, there's a good chance that I personally will pack and ship the book and there's almost nothing I would prefer to do. So please, while you're here, and if you can, we ask that you be generous to yourself and to us by supporting New York's premier independent art bookstore. Um, again, the link to browse and buy will be in the chat momentarily. Um, Rachel's gonna talk now and I'm gonna disappear. And then Susan and Johanna will talk for a while. And Johanna has some slides and the three of them are gonna talk for around 30 minutes. And then we're gonna do audience Q and A, but we all wanna talk to you now and we wanna keep things as open-ended and collaborative and flexible during the presentation as possible. So please, please avail yourselves to the Q&A box down below starting now. Our panelists will be reading the box as the questions come in and maybe I'll also come back close to the end to try to pose the rest of the questions that haven't already been answered if they haven't been answered. Um, note also that this event is being streamed live on YouTube and is being recorded for our YouTube and Instagram archives. Okay, I've blabbed too long and I'm distracting from the show. Is everyone ready? I'm ready. Thank you again for coming. Uh, what a treat it is to all be here today. I'm so looking forward to this. Uh, please, everyone, without further ado, this is Rachel Wilson from Litmus Press. Thank you so much, Ethan. Um, that was great. And I uh, will try not to repeat too many things that you have already said. Um, 
Uh, bear with me if I do. Um, my name is Rachel Gwen Wilson. I'm the managing editor at Litmus Press, uh, publisher of the um, two most recent out of three collaborations by Susan B. and Johanna Drucker. Those are Off-World Fairy Tales, which was published um, just this past fall, 2020, and Fabulous Feminine in 2015. We're also going to be talking about A Girl's Life, their earlier collaboration that came out from Granary Books. Um, so I just wanted to say hello and um, thank you to everyone for joining us today for this Fab Fem Collab conversation. Um, I just want to say a few thanks. Um, first, I want to thank Skuta Helgudsen and Kristen Mueller at uh, Art Book at MoMA PS1 Bookstore and uh, Lacey Soto at the Art Book Store at Hauser & Worth in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, yeah, they've just been consummate hosts um, and collaborators on today's event. So we're really super grateful to be working with them uh, and, and thanking them for their generosity. Also thanks especially to Ethan Weinstein who we just heard from for facilitating the Zoom meeting today um, and to everyone attending again. Um, it was a rainy day in New York earlier, and that seemed like a nice day for a Zoom, um, since we don't have to leave the house, but now I see the sun is coming out, and hopefully people are coming in from all over the place anyhow. So um, I'm going to introduce Susan and Johanna, and then say a few words about the talk, um, which again is maybe more of an open discussion, um, and, and then we'll get started. So Susan B. is an artist living in Brooklyn. She is represented by Air AIR Gallery in New York, um, where she has had nine solo shows, most recently a really incredible show, Anywhere Out of the World, New Paintings, 2017, 2020. Um, just a really gorgeous show. And I think you can still see much of that online if, um, if you hop over to the AIR Gallery website. She's had solo shows at many other venues and her work has been included in many, many group shows. Um, B has published 16 artist books, collaborating with writers such as Susan Howe, Charles Bernstein, Johanna Drucker, Jerome McCann, uh, McGann, Rachel Levitsky, and Jerome Rothenberg. Um, B was the co-editor of Meaning from 1986 to 2016. Her artist book archive and the Meaning Archive at the Beinecke Library uh, at Yale University. And B was the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship in Fine Arts in 2014 and has had fellowships at McDowell Colony, uh, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and Yaddo. Johanna Drucker is the Breslauer Professor in the Department of Information Studies at UCLA. She has published and lectured widely on topics related to digital humanities and aesthetics, uh, book history and future designs, historiography of the alphabet and writing, and more. Her critical work on book arts and typography have been enormously influential, I think especially of the visible word, experimental typography and modern art, um, the century of artist books, and figuring the word essays on books, writing, and visual poetics, although there are many other titles. Those are, are three that are just standout um, books to me in my own writing and thinking about um, artist books. A collection of her essays, Graph Graphicis, Visual Forms of Knowledge Production, also appeared in the Harvard University Press Meta Lab series in 2014. And in addition to her academic work, Drucker is a prolific maker of artist books herself, both solo and in collaboration. These were the subject of a retrospective, Druckworks, 40 Years of Artist Books and Projects at Columbia College in Chicago in 2018. In 2014, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So um, in today's conversation, um, we're going to hear from Susan and Johanna reflecting on their history as collaborators over three books and almost 20 years. We were trying to pin down the exact date of when A Girl's Life uh, started, maybe 2000, 2001, maybe 1999, but um, somewhere around there it was published in 2002. Uh, and I hope that we'll also touch on topics like what is a feminist poetics and how might it intersect with hybridity, pastiche, procedural play, speculative poetics and writing and art and the imagination. We have a lot of stuff to talk about in a short amount of time. So I'll just um, get going. So for the first 30 minutes, as, as Ethan mentioned, we'll um, talk and we'll, we'll see some slides from Johanna. And then we'll have 15 minutes of Q&A, open Q&A at the end. But again, please do put your questions into the chat um, throughout our, our, our talk and we might um, pull them out 
as we go along or circle back to them at the end. Um, and I'm going to kind of kick things off by um, sort of opening a, a line of um, discussion or conversation. Um, so I wanted to ask, uh, Susan and Johan, I wanted to ask the two of you, what initially drew you together um, to collaborate on A Girl's Life? How did that, uh, how did that begin? And you know, why work together um, rather than on one's own? Um, why collaborate? And this is a kind of question that, that I have, um, yeah, in a big picture sense, but particularly with your three projects. And then over the course of these three books, um, have you felt like there's been a, a sort of evolution in your collaborative practice? Has it deepened? Has it shifted course? Um, uh, what are your strategies? Uh, if you can tell us your secrets. <laughs> and um, I also want to ask um, or hear about, you know, what, what feels to you, what makes a collaboration feel like a success? Like it's really kind of come together to have a life of its own. So uh, if you can take us away, thank you. Well, <laughs> why don't you start? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, uh, it's interesting that we've been, this is our third project together, but I think the first one that we started on, we had both worked with other collaborators. So it, it Johanna had worked with Brad Freeman and other people. I'd worked with Charles Bernstein and then Susan Howe. And so, it, it, but we were friends from, 1977 or so when we met, uh, of course, at a small press book fair <laughs> um, that was in Bryant Park. So our, you know, we were friends, but we always worked separately, um, but we admired each other's work. And of course, it came up that maybe we should do a project together. And Johanna sent me the manuscript of Girl's Life, which was a very dense manuscript. And I edited it pretty much took a half of it out, maybe more. And then um, we started working on it. Um, and we had a few ideas and she had some imagery she was interested in, some teen magazines. And I had paper dolls and it was really about an, uh, a little girl growing into adolescence was kind of the theme. Um, should I show some pictures yeah. from that, Susan? Yeah. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and show, uh, we, ha we have all three of the books in this slide deck, but we can come and go from it. Um, I'll start with the, um, you know, the slides of a girl's life here. Um, and uh, again, which came out in 2002. Um, and this is the cover. And um, the, the book really was in part inspired by the genre of what we called the pink magazines, which mm -hmm. are magazines aimed at tweens. And so, you know, it's just, um, there's a whole construction of kind of pre-adolescent gendered identity that's pretty complicated in these magazines. And I think we were sort of interested in, in that, um, construction, but also in the genre of the magazines. And, um, and Susan's work, um, well, both of us, I think, have always been interested in cliches about women's lives and, and depictions. I did a book called Narratology in 1994 that was all about these different kind of cliches according to which women imagine um, that their lives might be lived. So, you know, you see it in an image like this where it's like, here's the girl and is this what she's supposed to imagine she becomes? So, um, you know, murder is just a little bit further than I thought she would go, Dawn said out loud to herself. I mean, there's a kind of, you know, flirting with the edge of things. Um, and again, you know, I've always loved Susan's um, images. I mean, you know, just look at the richness and, and, you know, interesting combination of the figure, the stance, the background, the textures, the patterns. So, you know, it's collage, but it's painterly and um, deadly, <laughs> you know. And <laughs> actually also looking at a lot of film noir imagery. Right. And I was very interested in pinups. And it was also somewhat taking uh, imagery from uh, different places. So this is actually from a pinup magazine from the 40s and uh, using, repurposing it and, and, and embracing it in a way. And I always love this page. She crouched beneath her nightmare <laughs> and waited. 
So, you know, uh, what we did was I did the pictures and then we added the type um, together in some cases. Um, I did go and work with Johanna in person on this. Yeah, book. yeah, you did. Um, I mean, in some ways, though, I love this book um, and it's not a criticism of the book. It was the hardest for, for us, I think, of the collaborations because we hadn't collaborated before. And also because, I don't know, it, it's a pretty complicated book. Um, it took a while to get, you know, the kind of distillation of the text exactly right. Susan's a great editor and she did a super job, but we kept distilling it and distilling it. I mean, honestly, Susan, I think we got down to about 10% of the original text because we wanted it to just be these really punchy kind of, you know, lines. Um, and I think you know, that was sort of my doing because I kind of really took your text and cut it up. So in yeah. a way, um, somewhere the, is the real manuscript. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have the manuscript, but- The manuscript yeah. was, was, you know, was so dense and I yeah. didn't really understand how I was going to make that into the kind of book that it ended up being, which is a very kind of airy and um, kind of spontaneous looking book, even though I don't know how spontaneous it was. But I was working with watercolor, so there, there wasn't that much room for, for changes, really. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, no, and again, you know, the I think we did the scans of the images and then I put the type on top in InDesign. And this was, you know, one of the first kind of um, times I had played around with drawing with type in that way. I had done some work with Brad and other areas where I was playing with type image relations, but this was really free form. Um, and we had fun doing that. Um, all right, so should I, should I stop the slides? Should we take a pause um, or should we? Yeah, I guess I, I have a, a kind of, if I can interject there, I'm, I'm interested in, um, you know, Susan, that you, cut up the text as if you were kind of collaging it. Um, and, and then also how that, I mean, to kind of stay with this question of um, the evolution of your collaborative practice in your second collaboration, Fabulous Femine, um, I feel that the text there, Johanna, you've just gone ahead and done a cult kind of a sort of interesting, maybe you can describe the process that you use to create that text, but it has a sort of cut up feeling so uh -huh. it's like as if you shifted your sort of poetics a little bit subsequent to the first collaboration, maybe is that would that is that accurate? Yeah. <laughs> I think in the first collaboration again, um, uh, where Susan and I, I think found a synergy, um, Susan, you can disagree if you like, but um, was in our our love of pulp and noir and you know kind of melodrama and you know these teen magazines. So we're really playing with kind of like bold strokes of genre, right? And lurid, like the word lurid belongs there. You know, it's like um, so we're really having fun with that um, extreme language. And then in Fabulous Femini, which we wanted to do as an homage to various women that we knew and some whom we had lost, but also to recognize, again, predecessors, women whose work or thoughts or whatever we thought was important. Um, I did this thing where I, I, this is the cover, beautiful cover. Um, this is Emily, our dear Bronte, mm. Oops, and Billy. Um, what I did here, you can see in Elizabeth I, I love this because Susan put these, you know, jewels onto the page before we scanned it. Um, but what I did was um, I had been inspired by a compression algorithm that I had found um, on Scott Weingart's blog, I believe. And, um, and so what I did was I imitated the, um, the algorithm, the compression algorithm. And I told Susan that I really used a compression algorithm <laughs> to write this. But in fact, what I did was I tried to use the same kind of um, co-location um, you know, uh, principles and word frequency principles, and then read through a whole mass of stuff and then just like, you know, compress it in my brain. So, you know, so it's, it breaks up the syntax because it's supposed to read like something made, um, who, Elizabeth I, whose name has become an era, a heart, a head, a queen. So that you get this kind of just, you know, um, density. It's dense again, all my writing's dense, but it just pulls the, um, the, the, a lot of the nouns um, up into focus out of the syntactic web. 
And the other thing that, you know, I, I, we had a lot of disputes about which 25 women, we both had lists of at least 50 women that yeah. we've been happy to include in the book. I mean, because there's, you know, so many heroines and people that we admired that we would love to have put in the book, but, you know, we had to come to an agreement about who to put in. So there's a lot of queens actually, I noticed. I don't remember any disputes, that's funny. I really don't. Um, but, you know, going back to what, here's Bodica, the next queen. Um, and again, Susan's collages inspired the typographic layout. So I wanted to call attention to the, you know, the structure of her um, forms. But for me, what makes a successful collaboration, and one of the reasons I love these books, is that these are things I, I just couldn't do on my own, right? I, I don't have all the pieces to do this. Here's Virginia Woolf, for instance. And, you know, it's like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't begin to enter into this kind of visual language. It's not, it's not something I'm fluent in. Well, I think also one of the things that I wanted to do, like, for instance, with the Virginia Woolf was look, I, I was actually searching for like, lesser known pictures of her. And also pictures of the people at different ages. Hmm. Yeah, and that's right. Oh, I included this pa passport picture, which I'd never seen before, um, but also things that I thought were significant visually to her, for instance, the lighthouse, because I love the book to the lighthouse, and also the idea of water. Um, so, and then I made for, um, Johanna asked me to make spots, which were these little, um, what you see on the left, is the spot for this page. So I made spots for every page. Now, I don't know if they were all even used, but it was really fun to make the little spots. And sometimes those were more spontaneous because they didn't have to take the shape of the, you know, we knew what size the pages were. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, and we did these bleeds um, and, you know, the colors for the type were just taken from sampling the colors in the image. Um, and um, here's uh, Sonia Delaunay. Um, and the last, this is the last of the slides from this is Cleopatra. I love this page. It's completely wacky. So it's like, how sinewy can you make type B to match these incredible images and, you know, still have it be legible. So it was fun. And also, um, I think, you know, <clears throat> I want to say something about this book is that unlike certain other things. I think Judy Chicago's dinner party, this is pretty funny, you know? Yeah. I mean, I was looking for kind of humorous imagery also. Yeah. You see sort of the Cleopatra in, um, you know, odd poses. And it, it wasn't all, it was a lot of it was very tongue in cheek, in fact. Even yeah. They, they are, yeah. They are heroines, but they're not they're not, um, it's not all very, very serious, I would say. Yeah, I mean, look, here's Theda Barra playing Cleopatra, for instance. So, you know, it's really great. I don't think this is the final version of this page though, when I'm looking at it, Susan, because we would never have let that type do that down there. Yeah, so I think this, yes, must be from it's an earlier version. <laughs> True. Yeah, so I think humor, play, inventiveness, you know, I think, you know, the, the idea that feminism is always this kind of didactic or serious project of recovery, you know, we, we wasn't really where we were going. We wanted to have fun with this. And this book, I think was, so I, I said, I don't remember any disputes. This book to me was totally fun to do. Um, and uh, so. Yeah, um, I love the irreverence of, of um, yeah. you know, the, um, you know, we were talking a little bit about, uh, you know, sort of, both of your relationship to history or the historical in your work. And, and this book I think is um, just so playful with what that means and to kind of have to create, um, a, you know, a personal pantheon in a sense uh, mm -hmm. and to be able to kind of eclectically pick and choose and then sort of throw everything together synchronically also. And, and that sort of happens, I think, in, in off-world fairy tales too. Um, you know, with regard to genre, the kinds of mixture of, of imagery, um, robots and ninjas <laughs> and fairies, you know, all, all sort of together uh, cohabiting on the page. Um, and so I just, I, I find that to be um, 
just a really exciting kind of space to occupy. Well, I think this brings us to your idea of pastiche, which um, I mean, because these are all collage books, um, because my work with them has all been using, using collage and using a lot of sources, I think the pastiche partially comes into that. And then also I'm, I'm painting, I'm, I'm drawing. I mean, I sort of see these more as drawings in a way um, because I'm using pencil and I'm using watercolor. And um, so the collage elements are, are integrated in, but there's also collage in terms of the text, which yeah. I find exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, what I love also is like in an image like this, right? It's like, are those spots in space or are they on a surface? You know, all the weird spatial things that go on here are just like so interesting. And again, for me, it kind of confuses the figure ground relations in the same way that the pulling of the, you know, um, chunks of language out of their syntactic, um, you know, network does. So, mm -hmm. um, so should we talk about Off World, our newest little treasure here? <laughs> yes, please. Yes. So um, the last book was done in, it came out in 2015 and I, I didn't really know that we were gonna follow it with a third book. So now, now I tend to see these three books as a trilogy. Yeah. Which wasn't actually totally intended, certainly wasn't intended when we started the first book you just never know what you're going to do next. And this book has been incredibly fun. This was another collaboration, which I really, really enjoyed. Yeah. Working well, on this began because I went to see Susan um, in, uh, in New York in the spring of 2019. Um, I was up in um, New Haven and she was doing these, this is the cover, but let me go in and show you. She's doing these like completely, you know, vivid, colorful, lively, like, you know, amazing, you know, they're not very big, but they were very complex um, images. And I said, oh, this, these need something really whimsical. They need something really fun. And, um, and I said, you need to find somebody who can write something fun. Right. So then I went back to New Haven and I wrote the, um, the princess and Iner inertia and the princess, the first fairy tale and sent it to her and said, maybe this would work. Yeah, so. I mean, I, I was so appreciative that um, I was doing all this work in my studio and was all about sort of fantasy landscapes, but I didn't know which way it was going. It was more like I just felt like doing it and it didn't have any stories in mind with it. I mean, they seem like they might tell a story. And so it was very thrilling when Johanna came over and she said, I think, I think I could write some stories to some of these images. And I sent, as, as I recall, I sent her scans of the images that I had done. And in the end, it got more complicated because she was writing and then I was doing, I think, images in response. Yeah. It went both ways, yeah. Yeah, this really went both ways because again, I was inspired by Susan's paintings to write the first couple of fairy tales, but then I just started writing, since she liked them, I said, okay, I'll write some more fairy tales. And then she did some images. So mm -hmm. some of the tales were written to match images she'd already done and others, she made the image to go with the, the tale. Here's the, the list of, of contents and you can see it's a puzzlement. Like even the little panda isn't quite sure what to make of these fairy tales. <laughs> it's like, what meme streams and moonbeams? So one of the questions we get is who are these for, right? Mm -hmm. who, who is the, who's the audience? Like with, with A Girl's Life or Fabulous Femini, you know, it's our peers, it's it's other women, young women, other, other and men, you know, but, but for this, it's like, it looks like a kid's book, but as a friend of mine pointed out recently, the word simulacrum is not exactly in the kindergarten vocabulary. I'm not sure that's true. I actually think simulacrum is in the kindergarten vocabulary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but you know, who were Oscar Wilde's fairy tales for? And even the Grimm's fairy tales. I mean, fairy tales, you know, they, they are cross-generational and people pick up what they want to from them. This is the poor princess. 
So here again, Susan would do these very, uh, I'll come back to this, wait, I wanna show, Susan would do these very rich, complex, I mean, crazy complex images. And we would start putting the, the text in and I'd say, well, you know, Susan, I think I need like some, I need some extra stars and moon, you know, and, and can you get me another figure? And so, you know, this was art to order. <laughs> Well, I, I love being assigned completely insane things. So she would, I would, she would actually, at one point I had a piece of paper and I was writing down everything in a phone conversation, like mm -hmm. said, a cloud, I need a cloud, I need a stars, I need, you know, a woman on a cloud with carrying symbols or something. I, I, I need a frog. To, <laughs> Sounds was, like a poem. This <laughs> was so incredible. So it was very inspirational. I would go into my studio with this list and I would just, it was really fun, a fun assignment because it, it was completely wacky and imaginative and almost had no logic to it. So um, I like, I like doing things without logic. So there's a lot of little, I used a lot of little stickers that I bought um, when I was abroad in South Korea and in China, and also I traveled to India. So I had all of these, these images that I, that I was really inspired to put in. Also stickers for small children, like ballerinas for girls and owls. And you can, if you, if you get close to it, you can see there's Egyptian icon. Yeah, yeah, there's the Egyptian stuff and, you know, the little insects. And so, but again, it's just like, there's so much going on in these pictures. And so we kept a lot of white space here too, to balance that out. So in this case, it just felt like, yeah, there needs to be some place to breathe for the type. Um, and occasionally we did some shaped stuff like this, the, the little pods. Um, and again, you know, what are these exactly? You know, it's like, yeah. ooh. Yeah. I, I was also actually sitting with the text and, you know, there's a whole thing in here about a pod and who's a sleeping boy in the pod. Yeah. So left is my interpretation of your <laughs> sleeping boy in the pod. And then on the right, they went, you know, it started to explode. So um, the rocket got off course. And so that was my interpretation of the rocket going off course. I mean, you know, you, you can kind of follow along with the images. They do relate to some part of the text, generally speaking, um, in a loose way, I have to say. Yeah, yeah sure. So much going on in terms of, um, you know, the initial compositions and then the sort of assignments um, and then these sort of responses that you're generating on your own without an assignment. Um, but I, 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 love, I love hearing you talk about the assignments. Um, <laughs> there's something to me, it sort of makes me think of, you know, like a homework assignment or something. And, you know, but then instead of that becoming um, a burden or something onerous, you know, it's, it's like uh, having the instruction is sort of a way to be liberated into a sort of play. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that to me is really, that's really interesting. Um, you know, well, I have to say that I generally, you know, I've also worked with Charles Bernstein and Susan Howe and other people where I will sometimes just take an element from one of their poems and kind of orient myself towards that or, or in a lot of places uh, other than in this or when I worked with Jerry Rothenberg, um, I set the type myself. So in a way I was more in control of the final product in the sense that I was also laying out the type and setting the type. Whereas here, what I like about it is Johanna just takes care of all of that part of it, which for me is, um, I'm not really that interested anymore in doing that aspect. Uh, the place where it shows itself most clearly though is in the cover because there I hand drew. Yeah, I love the cover. So that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really lively and, and, and yeah, works really well. Um, now this was a totally fun book to do and it was a fun book to write, I have to say, you know, it's like, 
sucked into the darkness and turned into antimatter. The creatures in the sleeper pods went through some pretty fast changes. You know, it's like, what in the world does that sentence mean? And, and yet it holds together. And here's some of the spots that were ordered. Can you get me a robot in a rainbow, rainbow please? <laughs> you know? And this is one of the final images, just wacko. It's just so complicated you know, with all these ninjas and pandas and, you know, I don't know what drug this frog is on, but he's a happy frog. So. Well, I, I, th but this relates to a particular passage in one of the works where it talks about, I think he takes a ladder, the little boy takes a ladder to the yeah, sky. Yeah, yeah. So I was actually trying to I was trying to stick to your text. <laughs> I mean, I, I they're also very complicated um, and more lengthy to do than they look. Like I would spend quite a long time getting oh. the elements because it's all watercolor well, these, wash yeah. and pencil. And and so even though they have a, I think they have a light feeling, but in fact, they were very um, time consuming to make. Oh yeah, I believe it. <laughs> I totally believe it. So, well, I think we should probably go out of the slides um, at this point, if that okay yeah. with you guys, Susan, do you want to say anything else about slide before I take it out? Well, I think one thing I could say in terms of the pastiche question um, is, well, I think I, I would say that it's the stickers, because I was using these children's stickers, it brings this element of, um, that's where the childlike quality, I think, comes from. And I've become totally like a collector of stickers, <laughs> um, which is, I don't even know how it happened or when it happened, because I don't even think as a child I was that interested in stickers, or even if there were stickers, I collected. We I didn't have stickers then. No. So it's something that totally fascinates me, and, and I've been using them in other works that I've been doing. Yeah, they're really great. So great. that's it. You know, um, I, I was wondering, I wanted to ask Johanna, you know, you went and you, you saw these pieces that Susan was making and you sort of thought fairy tale, like that was a genre that popped into to your mind. Um, and I wanted to ask just about, about that, like what was drawing you at the moment to the fairy tale genre and how are these a, a spin on the fairy tale and this sort of, I don't know, this new genre that you're creating almost of um, speculative fairy tale, the off-world fairy tale, uh, which is great uh, and, and lends itself to the, the sort of fantastical language yeah. and vocabulary in this book, which I have a seven month old son who uh, isn't yet literate, but I think really likes the sound of this book because there are these, <laughs> these sort of words that he's never heard before. Um, so I, I, I think that, um, that it's great for a kindergarten <laughs> reading level, but um, but yeah, if you could say a little bit more about the fairy tale genre and what you're doing here. Sure, you know, I, I mean, and again, because we have three very different genres in these books, right? We have one that's really kind of pulp noir, you know, one that's really biographical portrait, and then we come to the fairy tales, and you know, fairy tales. The great thing is that you know they don't have to follow logical rules. Right, magic, magic explains everything or magic is the excuse for things not to be explained. And so there's a kind of logic here. What, what's interesting here, there's the logic of the syntax, but there's not a logic necessarily in terms of a world it references. So I mean, it's not illogical, but it's like some of those sentences you start in one place and you end up, you know, sort of three steps, four steps down and you're like, how did I get from here to here? And that's, I think a lot of, you know, I think of, you know, the tales of Hoffman and uh, I mean, again, Oscar Wilde's always my great inspiration for fairy tales because they're so, you know, kind of intense. Um, but, you know, again, the, the great thing is that, you know, they, they don't have to follow the actions in a fairy tale, do not have to follow the rules of, you know, everyday pedestrian world logic. And I think that I felt that way also about doing the, the, the drawings, that there was no particular logic to the drawings. Mm -hmm. They have a kind of inner logic to me. It's like I see the space of the drawings as being a certain place. 
Um, we also had a, a planet of cats and one of dogs, <laughs> which was so much fun for me to do. I mean, I was really thinking more along the lines of Alice in Wonderland or Edward Lear or yeah, yeah. sort of a Victorian in a way. I've always been a very fond of the Victorian sensibility. Yeah. Um, also, I wanted to have a lot of humor in the, mm -hmm. in the whole product. Um, actually, I think there's humor in all three books, but there's the funniest, maybe the oddest pages of Fabulous Femini are, um, you know, Lucille Ball, which is, I think, a very funny page, and also Lizzie Borden, which was Lizzie <laughs> Borden. That's yeah. what I was going to say. Like, really got excited about <laughs> getting to do the acts. Um, and it was like very bloody and 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 that was sort of a campy thing because obviously she's not anybody that we necessarily look up to but we also had had Susan Sontag and all these other you know very Rosa Parks we had some incredible women that were real heroes and heroines and then we threw in a few little ringers that were <laughs> kind of like to show that our attitude was not total seriousness yeah yeah that's i mean there's something about that that resonates with this book too i mean i think about the fairy tale as having a didactic kind of quality sometimes but almost always is also subversive and here i think the sort of subversive element uh definitely overpowers the the didactic sort of function of fairy tales or you know maybe in in um their illogicality or re resistance to um, a kind of a kind of transparent logic or a, an expected logic and in, in language or in visual form, and that's where um, you know there's this sort of subversion yeah. happening. We expect a moral, and well, I don't know. We get a boy in a pod. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, I think there's a feminist aspect to that. You know, it's like you know whose rules. Right. I mean, whose rules? So, you know, it's like, um, no, you know, we just won't. We'll, it's like set it up, but then, whoop, you know, sort of do something fun with that. Um, so, yeah. Um, I, yeah. I'm, but the humor is important to both of us, I think, um, and always has been, whether it's very dark humor or it's more playful humor. I mean, I don't think that off world fairy tales is very dark. I think it's pretty light. And of course, it was written before the pandemic. <laughs> And so I think in some ways, it's like, we need humor more than ever. <laughs> so. Actually, if we had worked on it this year, I, I, I don't even think we could have done it. I yeah. think actually it was very, very much of a pre-pandemic type of project where sort of fantasy and fun and, um, you know, we, we were kind of working out of an element of, of fun that, I haven't experienced that much this exactly, season. you know, and also I had been traveling a lot and so had Johanna and we got to meet up and we got to work in person, which is always a treat. So I think, you know, this is, it's interesting that I see the three books as being the product of our friendship, which goes back way before the books and has survived the, co the collaboration too, because Collaboration can be, te you know, people can get tested. Can you talk about that um, a little bit more? I mean, I know that. Um, I don't want to name names. But yeah, or I mean, in, in, you know, <laughs> Johan, you said you couldn't remember any dispute, uh, you know, ever between. Yeah, you no. About it. Are there moments where um, you didn't agree on something? How did you kind of, what happened there? What did it bring the work? I don't think we ever had any kind of major disagreement. It was much more, I think, from time, I mean, like Susan's saying about, you know, which women should we put into Fabulous Femini and so forth. Um, for this book, I don't think we ever hit any, you know, bumps. Um, it was really, uh, you know, really fun. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think when Susan was saying she didn't want to name names, she wasn't going to name me. It was <laughs> other, other collaborators. And I agree. I mean, you know, that the collaboration can be can be a tricky business, but I've been blessed and lucky in my collaborations. Um, my collaborations with Brad Freeman were always good and with Emily McVarsh, who was, you know, again, wonderful to collaborate with on creative project as well as intellectual project. You know, Susan was ed an editor at Meaning and I wrote for Meaning. And so I got to know her also in that 
role and you know to to trust her judgment and to benefit from it so you know i mean i don't know i mean susan may have a different version of the story but i think the best thing is just to give in I, uh, <laughs> not everybody gives in um, especially right. especially when i was working as an editor i would say that's the place where there are more disputes over wording and um you know also, Mira Shore and I, who edited together for 30 years, um, and of course, Johanna had a piece in our very first issue in 1986. So um, we published a lot of Johanna's writing, but we were also very stern editors, you have to admit. You were good editors. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's with editing in magazine is a whole different matter because there's, yeah. a, there's a lot more that goes into it. Um, that's not so personal, actually, you know, you know, like what is the issue about and all this. Also, we edited a lot of um, artists writings, which, you know, a lot of artists don't write or can't write. <laughs> so for editing their writings was a bit of a challenge. But um, I have to say, sometimes people don't like um, the imagery I choose, or they feel that the poem isn't really served by what I've come cooked up for it. <laughs> um, you know, Charles Bernstein is very um, easygoing usually, but occasionally he'll just say, no, you know, that's mm -hmm. no good. <laughs> yeah, when you start from scratch. Um, usually I try to salvage something. Uh, I don't really, I mean, I'm, I'm flexible in a certain way. And if, I, if the poet really feels, mostly poets don't object to what I do or they don't really get a chance to. Um, and it's the publisher who ends up making the decisions. <laughs> but um, that's also a very important part of the collaboration is who is publishing it. Yeah. And, you know, the form. So we've been very lucky with these three books because I think they have a similar format and they do seem to be, they, they make sense as a, as a trilogy, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we were so lucky to have witness. <laughs> Yeah, we we have really appreciated Litmus's role in this, and you know the production and the public, you know, sort of the publicity, the promotion, the support. It's you know it's very affirming. Um, so it's great. I mean, Susan and I both, yeah, I think I really. And also uh, H.R. Hagenauer, who actually put the design together for us. I mean, she she actually. Um, did the production on the final product <laughs> and the last two books also. And of course, Steve Clay of Granary Books and Tracy Grinnell. Of mm -hmm. yeah. So I think you always have to bear in mind that you're working with a publisher if you're working with a publisher. When I, when I do my unique, um, you know, when I do my paintings or I do my accordion books, which I've been doing one of a kind books, it doesn't really come up because it's just whatever I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. So. No, same with me when I'm doing my own books. It's like, yeah, you know, but, um, but no, I think, you know, the nice thing about collaboration, just to kind of pull this, you know, sort of together here as we're coming toward the end. The nice thing about collaboration is that it does produce something other than what you do yourself. Right. It's like there's something it's like it's a it's it's a Johanna and Susan book. Right. It isn't a Johanna book with Susan pictures and a Susan, you know, Susan pictures with, you know, it's like it really I think in our case, the synthesis um, really merges uh, the uh, the verbal and the visual um, components in a way that is a real synthetic whole. And, you know, not all collaborations are like that. Some collaborations you can feel, okay, there was a text and there's images and they talk to each other, but they stay discreet. And I think in our case, the back and forth has really meant that the writing will sometimes change to match the image, you know, to, to pull out, you know, in response to the images, it'll be generated by in response to the images, images are generated in response to the writing. So. I think there's a whole lot more kind of synthesis in that way, especially in off world um, than there is in, in, in some other collaborations. Well, it's funny because when you say that, I think it's so true. <laughs> I mean, you, you yeah. put it so beautifully. And then I think of the times that you said like that cloud is no good or, you know, you had, you had these little moments where you would say stuff like put a bigger arrow in or. Yeah, yeah. 
And that was like so fun for me because since I haven't been in school for quite a while, I find these assignments kind of like exciting. You know, it's like, oh, okay, I'm going up to the studio and make some arrows today. <laughs> um, because otherwise when I'm working on my own stuff, when I'm doing my own paintings, nobody tells me make an arrow, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's very generative to be told uh, to come up with an image, I think, for it's me. Interesting. For me. Susan, though, because some of the, I feel like the iconography in your paintings, you know, I see it sort of circulating through the, the, the images in the books too. And I was wondering about that, like which way is this cross fertilization just kind of back and forth all the time between, you know, these, these book projects and- I think it's that... true because as I was talking about the arrows, I was yeah. thinking about the fact that I put all these arrows into the painting I was working on at the same time. I have... <laughs> I have two ends of my studio. One is where I do the books and the watercolors, and one is at the other end where I'm doing the oil paintings because they can't mix. You know, it's like oil and water can't mix. But um, it's funny that now that you mention it, the clouds and the and the eyes and the and a lot of those arrows turned up in the paintings. Yeah, I was kind of doing at the same time. So, so a, a question. A question, a question in the Q and A yeah. is is whether one of us is more bossy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and what's the answer? <laughs> I'm not answering that question. <laughs> I, again, I think, I honestly think with me and Susan, there's a really healthy give and take. And if Susan's just sort of kind of, and I, I mean, I think of Susan's being very accommodating and flexible, but if she says, nah, then she's probably right. You know, I mean, honestly, I think it's okay. And I think she trusts me too. If I say, no, I don't think we should do that with the type, right? Or something, I, it's like, you know, I don't, it's not like she's gonna say, oh no, we have to have, you know, you know, sort of bold sans serif here or something. And, I, you know, so I, I think we've been, I think we do really trust each other's um, aesthetic and um, the division of labor, even though it's very high, even though we have all this hybridity in the work, I think, you know, works really well. And I, I don't feel like there's any hierarchy between us. Um, I really feel like there's, you know, a, a very peer um, exchange. Um, well, I appreciate that you let me do a lot of things like cut up your first manuscript. I, oh, when, yeah. I, when I suggested that, I was like, I, if I had suggested that to most other people I worked with, that they would Actually, some of them would have said okay also, but but I was actually sort of surprised that you kind of let me take charge that way because yeah. I wasn't the writer. I was sort of just the person who was collaging your work in a way, taking bits and pieces of it and putting it together. And I think that is a matter of trust that you let yeah. me do that. I, and then I, I felt like I was letting you put things on top of my drawings, <laughs> you know, like run type over my drawings. And it didn't bother me. It like made me happy that you were doing right. that. Right. Yeah. So, and again, I see that as, you know, feminist collaboration. In other words, neither one of us is the boss, but when one of us has a strong feeling about something, again, I would tend to think, well, you're probably right. Um, and, uh, and why not? Um, so, yeah, I think it's all, you know, useful um, to, you know, sort of be willing to actually merge, um, you know, in a project. Um, and again, uh, it's been really fun to do these things with Susan. Yeah. And I think this, the idea of the synthesis of us together, making like a third, it's, a, it's like a third little monster, but it's <laughs> the two of us together become something different, you know, and, and, and that's really the part about collaboration that I really like. You know, anytime I work with a person, I find that I end up with something different than I would have if I was just on my own. There's a yeah. notable difference if somebody was actually sit down and figure it out, look at my books that I've done by myself and the mm -hmm. ones that I've done with other people. I mean, it's not that I don't have a style, but in a way I find myself orienting to whatever the manuscript is or whatever the project is. So. Yeah. What's really beautiful about that, I feel like you're also talking about allowing yourselves to be influenced and, you know, have your work really 
changed or impinged upon in certain ways. So that, you know, sort of also beyond the synthesis, like being affected, you know, and, and that's really, I think, yeah, that's a very beautiful thing. Well, and again, I think because both of us also have our own arenas in which we're doing all kinds of other things. It's like, well, if we're going to do this thing, it should be a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very dynamic. It's like, yeah. a, that's, that like, to me is um, so evident on the page. Yeah. No, it's, it's really been lots of fun. And so, you know, who knows, maybe there'll be another book ahead in, you know, 10 years and maybe not. And, uh, you know, <laughs> hard to say. Looking forward to doing more work with Johanna. <laughs> My favorite collaborator, but I shouldn't say that because then I'll get in trouble with the other ones. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, exactly. You have to be very careful. <laughs> You have to be really careful with collaborators and treat them all very equally. But. Yes, exactly. But we know some are better than, some are less difficult than others. <laughs> less possible. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it has been so great to talk with you. Do we have any other questions? No, that was kind of the only question I saw in the chat, so. Yeah. Um, we have a few more minutes, I suppose uh, we could, I don't know if we have time to dive into another question if we're ending punctually at four o'clock or um, we should say that again, the, um, the, the whole trilogy is available um, with these commemorative book plates that were designed and, and signed by Susan and Johanna. Very beautiful. And it's a special- Do you um, have one there to hold up by any chance, Rachel? I don't have the book plates, but do, Susan, Susan, maybe Susan's <laughs> running. Maybe she has a copy of the book plate she could hold up as our final, our final image here. Because I, I didn't have I, them. I'm holding up the book plate. Yes, yeah. see, beautiful. Yeah. All three I books. Say I really enjoyed making the book plate. That was another really fun assignment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, so um, yeah, this is the book plate, and it's signed. And it'll be in the three books if somebody orders them, um, which has, you know, they're being put in because we can't all come to the bookstore and sign them in person for the book party that never happened. So right, I'm, I'm the party proxy. I put the tape on the books. <laughs> oh, that's it. Um, right. Nathan, did you have a question or anything you wanted to ask us? You spend um, well. I do, although there's another question in the chat, and it's from Scooter. Oh. He oh. says, Rachel, how is working with those two? You need to <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> how did that start? The question was, how is working with, the, how were the two? Yeah, I, it has been an extreme pleasure. <laughs> it's a very simple answer. Um, yeah, really just, uh, it's lovely to be involved on, you know, this side of things and a little bit, you know, in, in the production, which was, you know, it was the book is basically done when it came to us, so there wasn't too much there. But handing it off to HR to have HR, you know, um, set the files into InDesign for the final printing. Um, so yeah, it's just it was it was all very smooth and very enjoyable, and I have loved being a part of this conversation today. Um, Thank you so I hope much. that you collaborate again so that we <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do an encyclopedia. <laughs> That would be amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, it's about time to opine on everything. <laughs> so think of the assignments you're going to get for that one, Susan. <laughs> molecules. There's going to have to be, I'll be assigning you molecules and flora and fauna and species and technologies and it'll be fun. The encyclopedia is ahead. The encyclopedic collaboration. <laughs> this is where it started. So thank all right. You so much. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Ethan. Thanks so much to the bookstore and for hosting us and good luck with your move. Thank you all for your generosity and reciprocity. What a delight. <laughs> all right. We'll do it again. Should I, should I end the meeting? All right. All right.